Today we're diving into a story that spans generations and explores the unique history of the Fugit family from Troublesome Creek, Kentucky. Hello folks, I'm Steve Gilling, along with Rod Mullins, and we're here to tell you a most interesting story of Appalachia. Ah, yes, Steve. The words Troublesome Creek bring a lot of things to mind with me. I start thinking about Knott County, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I start thinking about, oh, they have a newspaper up there that used to have an April Fool's edition that they would run constantly. Got people all scared to death when they first announced about the B-2 bomber showing up as a UFO. (laughs) Uh, But this one really interests me a great deal because I grew up hearing my dad talking about blue shins. Didn't quite understand what it was about until I got a little bit older. And then he started telling me, he said, well, it's about some people up in Kentucky who, well, had a unique skin color, I guess, if you wanted to say it that way. And it's always interested me. And you have found out some more information along the line to kind of add to this story to make it a little bit more interesting. Is that right? Yeah, well, we've done this story before. It's been several years. I think it's one of the first ones we did. Right. And, yeah, we've got a little bit of updated information on it. We just wanted to share that with folks. Frankly, also, some folks have been asking us to do this for a year or two. So I thought we'd do it for you. Well, ever so often, you often see it on social media about people asking questions about for the first time they've never heard of the fugit family from troublesome Mm -hmm. creek kentucky and it immediately starts generating again and again and again over and over so yeah it's a great time to bring this story back with a little bit more updates and tell everyone about this unique family from troublesome creek kentucky well let's get ourselves situated shall we Troublesome Creek is a remote and sleepy settlement in eastern Kentucky and is located not too far from Hazard. And it was there back in 1820 that a French orphan named Martin Fugit arrived with hopes of starting a family with his wife, Elizabeth Smith. What sets Martin and Elizabeth Fugit apart from the rest of the people in that area is a rare genetic condition they shared, one that can turn the skin a deep indigo blue. Indigo blue? That must have been quite a sight, huh, Steve? Oh, absolutely, Rod. You see, the Fugits each were carriers of the recessive gene that caused the condition. That meant they didn't have it, but when they got together and went on to have seven children, four of them inherited enough of this from each parent to exhibit blue skin. And the bluest of the blue Fugits was a lady named Luna Stacy, who had 13 children and lived to the ripe old age of 84. Now, fast forward to the 1970s, and we meet Benjamin Stacy, a great, great, great grandson of Martin Fugit and Elizabeth Smith, and the last known descendant to exhibit blue skin. And to the surprise of his parents and the hospital staff, Benjamin also inherited the family's distinctive blue coloring. Now, this was due to a condition called, and I'm going to try my best here, methamobaglob. Anemia. It's, it's hard to say. That's close enough, Ron. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's a condition that causes a rise in those methemoglobin levels, turning the skin blue and the lips purple. Well, in this case, the condition was inherited and caused by a faulty gene, most likely resulting in a deficiency of an enzyme called diaphorase which results in oxygen deficiency in red blood cells, causing the skin to appear blue. Fortunately, though, there were no physical health problems associated with the blue skin condition for the Fugit family. In fact, most of them lived long lives, well into their 80s and 90s. That's true, Rod. But despite their physical health, the Fugits faced deep shame and psychological trauma due to their skin color. The local community discriminated against them, causing them to seek greater and greater social isolation, which ironically exasperated the problem. Yeah, and it's heartbreaking to think that such a unique family trait 
became such a source of pain and being ostracized out of this whole thing. But why did the blue skin continue to manifest within the Fugit family? Well, Troublesome Creek was a small place with limited connectivity to nearby towns, for one thing. And this isolation led to a um, limited supply of potential marriage partners for the local residents, resulting in a significant amount of intermarrying within that very small community. Now, the tight-knit community inadvertently became an incubator for the blue skin condition to persist through generations. Now, let's talk about the arrival of Dr. Madison Caldwine in the 1960s. Now, he'd heard rumors of the blue people of Kentucky and was determined to investigate further. Dr. Caldwine was joined by a nurse named Ruth Pendergrass, who had encountered a woman with dark blue skin during her time at the county's health department. This encounter intrigued her and fueled their curiosity. They began meeting members of the Fugit family, including Patrick and Rachel Ritchie, who were described as being bluer in hell. Great way to describe it. And the Fugits were embarrassed by their skin color, and it weighed heavily on their self-esteem. Dr. K. Wine and Nurse Pendergrass performed medical tests to determine the cause of their blue skin. Eventually, they discovered that the blue Fugits lacked the enzyme diaphorase. And with this breakthrough, they sought a cure. Dr. K. Wine used a medication and dye called methylene blue to turn Patrick and Rachel's blue skin pink. That must have been an incredible sight, Steve, of seeing someone that color of blue. You don't expect to see something like that. Well, it certainly was, especially turning them pink, to be honest with you. Right, true. The, the effect, though temporary, showed that methylene blue was effective in temporarily altering their skin color. And the fugits were no longer blue. It's amazing. So what became of the blue fugits and their condition? Well, Rod, with better connections and a more integrated world, the chances of the recessive gene decreased over time. Although the gene may still be present within the family, it is far less likely to manifest the condition. Well, as for Benjamin Stacy, the great, 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 great grandson who was born in the 1970s, experts suspect that he only had one faulty gene. As he grew older, he outgrew his blue skin. You know, it's fascinating, Rod, how this unique family with a rare genetic condition has become a part of Appalachia's history. And if I remember correctly, they had some issues at first in getting some of these folks to take this methylene blue. And the story that I heard was that they explained it to them as saying, well, what you're going to do is we're going to give you this medicine and you're going to pee the blue out of you. And that's how they did that. Yeah. Wow. Well, again, you know, I'm sure that there were a number of different names and so forth. I still haven't been able to figure out where my dad, unless there was a, you know, missed letter or mispronunciation of a letter somewhere where they would have normally said blue skin people, they mm-hmm. said blue shins, you know, blue skins, blue shins. It's, it's pretty you know, easy to kind of make that mistake. And then considering the the dialect and so forth, that could have very well, you know, threw some people off. But, you know, my dad, when I first asked him about this and I said, you know, do you know anything about blue skinned people? And his immediate reaction was the blue shins. Oh yeah. I've heard of the blue shins before. And I'm like, I've never heard of him called that before. And that's when our explanation, his explanation to me, and he pretty much told the same thing as what we're talking about here in this story. And that was they were a very isolated group. A lot of people shunned them. They didn't want to be around them because they thought something was wrong, which there was, but it was nothing that was really terribly contagious in the fact that they carried this gene. And they really didn't learn about that until, what was it? Was it the 70s or the 80s is when they found this out? I think it was the 60s. 60s. And Dr. Okay. K. Wine did that, yeah. Okay, 
All right. I know UK had done a lot of research. They had done some things at one point, and they were also trying to help the people or testing them or something like that. But I couldn't remember if it was in the in the 60s or the 70s. Uh, you know, I've seen people in the 80s and 90s, even on talk shows sometimes with blue skin, but they have an entirely different type of condition as opposed to what the Fugits had. I've got something else here for you. Cool. A little bit of a side story. Okay. And that involves Madison K. Wine. Okay. Now, his full name was Madison Julius K. Wine, and he was named after his grandfather, who was a famous Kentucky poet hmm. known as the Keats of Kentucky. I don't know if you've hmm. never heard of this guy before. Hmm. I've heard of the Keats of Kentucky, but I've not, mm-hmm. I had not heard his name. Yeah. He, I think he died in 1920 or 1921, yeah. but he had some influence on a new generation of poets across America before he died. So that's his claim to fame. Wow. The other thing I found out was that about a year after he dealt with the Fugits, and well, let me give you some background. Dr. K. Wine was of the upper class Kentucky bluegrass society. Mm-hmm. Okay, lived in, I believe, in Lexington and a big fine house and a big fine neighborhood and all that. About a year after this stuff with the Fugits trying to help them, he and his wife, Mary, had been, I believe, to a party and had been drinking. Mm hmm. And the neighbors invited him to come over and sleep off his his drunk. And his wife was left in there to do the same thing at the house. The next morning, the neighbors went over to see how Mary was doing, and they found her dead sitting in her chair. Wow. Um, she appeared to have been drugged and maybe killed with two shot marks on her, like from a needle. Wow. There was an investigation, but it was real quick and pretty much hushed up a lot of stuff. Nobody was ever charged. A lot of people thought that Dr. K. Wine had done that. Mm-hmm. But at this point, it's one of those mysteries. Mysteries we'll uh, never mis- find out about. Yeah, the doctor died in 1985, and I think most everybody involved is, has passed away on that. And if you'd like to know more about this one, let me suggest another podcast for you. And they have no connection to us. Nobody's paid us to do this. It's just actually one of my favorite podcasts. It's called Southern Mysteries. Mm. And they have an episode on this that gets into a lot more detail than we have. So go check it out on your favorite podcast app. Neat. So There you go, Rod. I thought I'd give you a little bit of extra info that I came across when I was doing some research on this. I appreciate it. That gives me a whole lot more to kind of decipher and think about. And folks, with that, we wrap up today's episode of Stories of Appalachia. Join us next time for another captivating tale from this beautiful region we call home. Be sure to subscribe to the Stories Podcast on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss any of our stories. We're also on TikTok at Stories of Appalachia, on Instagram at Story Appalachia, and um, actually on a brand new app, something called Threads where we're there as Story Appalachia. So come on by and check us out. Thanks for listening, folks. Stay curious. Until next time, take care. So long, everybody. Everybody.